Shall we open our Bibles this morning to chapter 3 of Titus? And Father, we invite you to come and be our speaker today. Don't limit yourself to me, my skewed vision, even my own thoughts. Get in the way of your voice. I pray, Father, that the power of your Spirit would manifest through the teaching, through your gifts this day. In Christ's name, amen. Remind them to be subject to rulers and to authorities, to be obedient and ready for every good deed, to malign no one, to be uncontentious, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our lives in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us not on the basis of the deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out upon us richly through Christ Jesus, our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things I want to speak confidentially, uh, confidently so that um, those who have believed in God may be careful to engage in good deeds." These things are good and profitable for men, but shun foolish controversies, genealogies, and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. Reject a a factious man after a first and second warning, knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning by uh, being self-condemned. When I send Artemis and Trichicus to you, Make every effort to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Diligently help Zenos, the lawyer, and Apollos on their way so that there is nothing lacking uh, for them. And let our people also learn to engage in good deeds, to, make, uh, to, meet, uh, to meet pressing needs, that they may not be unfruitful. All who are with me greet you, Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Crete was an island, and um, it it was an island that was probably like a lot of what off the coast of Africa is today, a lot of pirates. It's not parrots, as stated in your notes. Uh, That's my mistake. It's, you know that you're a bad speller when you can't even get it close enough where the, the spell checker gives you a different word, and my wife missed it, and my secretary, she doesn't have to do it because Judy usually does it. But it's not parrots. But it was an island that was kind of a, a lawless, uh, pirating kind of mentality. People stabbing other people in the back. People living lawlessly. And uh, Nero uh, was the emperor at the time, and uh, we are going to focus in this text on how, Paul says, on how we spend our lives. Is looking at your life as you have so much time, you have so much resources, what do you give yourself to? I was talking to uh, a guy that I meet with on Sunday night. And uh, he has amazed me as I've gotten to know him more and more. He's really a, a brilliant person um, and understands biology and strains of yeast and viruses. And, and uh, he has a passion. He loves, to, uh, he's, he's, he loves brewing uh, his own beer. And he can talk about yeast strains until I glaze over. And I, you know, I, I don't really care about yeast strains and all that. But he said, you know, I don't want to do that. I want to do something medically to help people. I want to spend my life with something more 
worthwhile. And uh, I look at myself and I look at all of us together and we, we have lots of things that we can give ourselves to. We can spend our lives on things that we enjoy. We can spend our lives on things that make us happy. But Paul is writing to Titus in this chapter, I have found in this chapter alone, the, the word good deeds are repeated three times. And in chapter 2, uh, we see in verse 7, In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine and dignified. Uh, look at verse number 14 of chapter 2. That Jesus, that God... Uh, that he might for himself uh, purify, redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for what? Good deeds. And then we have verse 1, be ready for every good deed. Verse number 8, the, uh, the last part of verse number 8, that God may be careful to engage um, in good deeds. Now look down at verse 14. And let our people also learn to engage in good deeds. So there is this whole thing about spending your life. And are you, you know, he's questioning whether we're in this lawless society and how are we spending our lives in the society in which we live? And how does that affect other people? And how does Jesus come into our world through his church bringing the light through everyday people, making a difference because they're being inspired by God, they're being awoken by God unto good deeds. Now, anytime you say good deeds in church, it's kind of like, oh yeah, we come to church and they say, be good, be good, you know, but that's not the message today. As a matter of fact, good deeds for salvation is a deterrent for real salvation. We are not saved um, by good deeds. We're actually brought salvation by grace through faith in Christ, saved unto good deeds. In other words, once we're regenerated, once we're alive by the Holy Spirit, then we have a new possibility unto good deeds that we didn't have before. And I would like to just draw your attention to three movements in this chapter that I just read. First of all, we find in verse 3 our former life. And then we find in verses 4 through 7 our transformation. And then we find um, in the last part our new life and where it takes us. So we have our former life, our transformation, and our new life. And it's going to be developed by Paul as he speaks into Titus the leader. And it seems to shift from a personal note to Titus to the whole church as this letter is probably read to the whole church. And we find that our former life was pictured in the same kinds of ways that Paul is describing the Christian life and what they were like in their former days before Christ came and appeared to them in love through the gospel. Look at what it says in verse 3. For we also were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved, to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. When you talk about your former life, you think, you know, um, what do you think about? Well, I was always curious, and I, I was brought to Alive to Christ during the 70s, and so, but the 70s seemed to be uh, a time uh, how many of you, well, most of you are not old enough to have lived in the 70s, but uh, I've had endless discussions with some of you about um, the anti-establishment and the whole sexual revolution and the drugs and the psychedelic drugs that expanded the mind supposedly and uh, brought many people into bondage and, uh, and into all kinds of lifestyles. Um, that, ha that were introduced in those uh, radical years in the 70s. Well, um, I, I was a believer then, so I escaped a lot of that sort of thing. I, I've never, um, people say that I'm an old hippie, but I'm really not. I'm an old Jesus freak. 
I've never smoked pot, um, I, and I'm, I don't know if I'm bragging, or I guess I'm bragging, I'm not complaining. I've never smoked pot, I've never done mind-expanding drugs. I've never been to a love fest, you know. Um, I haven't, I missed a lot of the dissipation and the, the things that, that um, a lot of my friends were engaged in. And uh, you, you look at that lifestyle and you look at where it, it takes people. And Paul is writing into that. He said, you know, he says, you are foolish yourself. And, it, you know, there's certain things that seem to be common sense things that, you know, you, you don't want to be addicted to drugs. It's, it's expensive. It can, it can fry your brain. You know, this is a pan and it's hot. And this is your brain. And then they crack the egg and this is your brain on drugs. Do you guys remember that, that commercial? Well, people were foolish. They did what's, what seemingly broke what seems to be common sense. And uh, he's describing them. Once you were foolish yourselves, you were disobedient. Disobedient to what God had for you. Uh, the ways of God. The laws of God are built on the ways of God. And so you were disobedient. You were deceived. You, you didn't know that you were foolish. You were deceived. You had something else speaking into your mind that you started listening to that you believed in that was not true. And you believed a lie. And the lie brings you into many kinds of, of bondage and pleasure. Spending your life in malice and envy with various lust and pleasures. You were carried away believing a, dece a deceptive lie. And now it's affected how you view yourself. And so in this case, here were these Cretans. They were party animals. They were, um, you know, like some of... You live in your dorms with this kind of party uh, mentality. People doing all kinds of and giving themselves to all kinds of various lust and pleasures, spending their lives on that. And because they're deceived, they're foolish. But they don't know that they're deceived and they don't know that they're foolish. And do you grab someone that's, that's doing drugs and you grab them by the collar and say, this is stupid, wake up. And, you know, we, we do a few interventions and we try to get people to see how foolish they are and that they're deceived, that the, the, the substance is controlling their life and it's deteriorating their relationship with their family and their friends. And so you have this intervention. But what really transforms is not so much the intervention. That's the wake-up call. It's when that person embraces their lostness and they come into a reality of who Christ is. And listen to this um, Listen to how Paul describes it in verse 4 through 7. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, the love of God, the kindness of God, and His love for mankind. Now, here are people who are deceived. They're foolish. And you want to say, you idiot! Go to hell! And God says, I love you, you idiot. <laughs> I love you. You're, you're foolish. You're blind. You're deceived. And how do I feel about you? Kind. Loving towards you. In his kindness, God reacts. Now, see, I am not like that. I am human. And I have many, many faults. Someone just told me today, we love you. And I said, well, you just don't know me. <laughs> if you knew me and then loved me, then I, I would see the, the extent of your love. But you see things that you like about me, and you think you like the whole person, but you don't know the whole package, you know. Well, you know, just the other day I was going to Anderson, and I, I'm irritated with the person in front going the same speed, and I'm flashing my lights, and... I'm telling them to get out of my way. I'm on a mission from God, you know. Get out of my way. And so this guy, he starts pulling over to get out of the lane when he, gets, when he creeps past after two miles, and me flashing my lights on his tail, you know. Come on, you idiot! You know, I'm wanting, you know. And I'm not feeling kindness. This guy is deceived. He's foolish the way he's driving, and someday I want to be a cop and just ticket all those people and get them off the roads. 
You know, I, I don't know. I, I'm being foolish, I know. I'm deceived and I'm foolish, okay. But thank you, thank you. <laughs> you understand where I'm coming from? And so this guy, he's going to pull over, but he's not going to let me around fast because he's going to stay halfway in the lane just to irritate me. So I go right up, and our mirrors are about that far apart. I mean, you know, being a stupid idiot. And I don't feel when people are foolish and they're pushing my buttons and they're irritating me and I don't like them and they're being foolish and they're deceived, I don't feel kindness to them. Do you? I, I, I don't like those people. Uh, I like people that like me and that get out of my way when I'm driving, you know. That's what I like. But God, get this, God has a capacity to love that I don't have. And for someone to say, guy, we really know you and we still love you, that's, that can only be God's love. Do you understand where I'm coming from? God seeing people in foolishness and in deception, living out in lustful pleasures, does not hate people. Listen to me. Give me your attention. You can't hate people who are in bondage like I do with people that drive like idiots. You are, and I am, called to have the Holy Spirit transform me in my attitude towards people that drive that way. I'm using this as an example because it's a safe example. Many of you pray for my driving. God bless you. Good luck. I pray that God will not hear you sometimes where I get tickets, but that he will correct me in nice, kind ways. And I want to be corrected in kindness by God. I don't want to be slammed against the wall. And so I'm looking at how God feels toward people who are uh, accomplished sinners, pirates, stealing, um, people twisted and perverted in sexuality, people cheating other people, people ripping off people's retirement funds. These people make me mad, you know. I'm in Yorktown, and this whole big deal with Yorktown having a secret meeting before the people come together and protest the taking out of health insurance for the part-time council people and the part-time employees angered me. And uh, I want to do something. But God reacts differently to people who are deceived than I do, who are living in foolishness. Just remember that the next time you want to bash somebody that's not like you. But just remember that they're caught, they're trapped. They can't get free on their own. They need Jesus. They need truth to set them free. And so we have this appearing of the kindness and the love of God that appeared in Jesus Christ. You see, before Jesus came, it was the Pharisees and the religious rulers that were really laying bad trips on people. And you take even the woman that was caught in the very act of adultery the religious people wanted to stone her, but Jesus, what? He forgave. He let, and he said, don't do this anymore. This is destructive. It's foolish. You've been deceived. And you need to live differently. But he freed that person. When Jesus came in love and kindness, he reacted differently to those who were trapped in foolishness and deception. Are you with me? And isn't it interesting that you are patient with yourself in your own deception and foolishness, in your own idiot stuff that you do, that you excuse yourself for, but when you see it in other people, you're angry. Do you know what I'm talking about? And so um, I find that, that the gospel is really good news. It's God's love manifested to deceived and foolish people that you want to beat their brains out. But God loves them. Do you understand this gospel? It's called Good news, if it's not the good news, read my lips, it's not the gospel. God in his kindness and his love. So, uh, then we have that salvation is seen as, par as apart from good works. Look at what it says. He saved us not on the basis of our deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. By the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. You are saved not because you clean up your act and do good. I'm going to start going to church and turn over a new leaf. Well, God bless you. That's not going to help 
you do anything but hear the gospel and respond. But it's not you going to church. It's not you being better. It's not you determining that you're going to change your life on your own power. Um, I don't know who picked the songs today. Was that you, Daryl? The songs that Daryl picked were all about that we're not saved. God doesn't accept us on our own righteousness. And we're learning that it's only through the blood of Christ. We're learning that it's only through the mercy of Jesus Christ. No one can be good enough to be saved by their own good works because we've all got a sinful nature that tilts us towards uh, the bad side. God doesn't weigh our good nature and our bad nature and see which side the, the scale tips and says, okay, you go to heaven, you go to hell. No, it's through faith in the mercy and the washing and the regeneration that God sends through his own work, his own blood, his own washing of regeneration by and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. So if you're here today and you think that I'm going to go to church and become better and I'm going to turn over a new leaf, uh, let me tell you that you are deceived and that is not true, that you will not go to heaven because you go to church. You will not go to heaven because you belong to a church. You will not go to heaven because you take communion. You will not go to heaven because your good outweighs your bad. You only go to heaven because of what Christ has done for you. When the love of Christ and the kindness of Christ appeared, he took away our sins. For those who trust in Christ alone, if there were any other way God would have surely done it than sacrifice his own son. But God so loved the world that he freely gave his son to be sacrificed for the whole world. That whoever would believe in their good works, no, in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So Paul describes their way of life before Christ, and then he talks about this transformation that happened when the gospel of Christ invaded Crete. And I'd like to talk about that because the goal of what we want to see in Newcastle as Eric and Elizabeth and the team go into Newcastle is that we want the gospel to penetrate. There's plenty of churches, but is the gospel penetrating Newcastle? Is the gospel penetrating Ball State University? Is the gospel penetrating Muncie? Is the gospel penetrating um, the pride tribe? It is, and it's making a difference. And God is stirring up people from the other side of the planet to do something about it, to translate the Bible, to provide means for people to live, and to show the love of Christ in really down-to-earth practical kinds of ways. So we have this washing and we have this regenerating work of the Holy Spirit it's not by your good deeds, it's by the work of Christ. And when he comes into your life, when you confess your sins, say, God, I can't do it on my own. I can't do it. I've tried. I can't do it. Save me. Forgive me. Come into my life. And he says, done. I'm into your life. The washing away of your sins is worked its way. You are free from your sins. So as far as the east is, from the West. And not only are your sins removed, you're regenerated by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into you and puts new desires in you that makes you a better person. You're regenerated. You see, we were all lost apart from God in foolishness, deceived, going towards destruction. But God's love appeared. Not only did he wipe your sins away and say, now do better this time, and you're on your own. He says, no, I'm going to live with you. I'm going to be in you. And my Holy Spirit is going to change your inner person. Tr inner transformation is going to work its way out in good deeds now. You have a new person. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Say you're, you're trying to change your life yourself. God says, it's foolishness. You can't. It's through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit to transform you and make you new. You can't do it on your own. He saved us not on the basis, verse 5 says, of good deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Mercy means that you are guilty and you are shown mercy and let off. But you're not let off just because God is winking. You're let off because... 
Christ came and paid your penalty and, ju and says you're justified. You're just as if you had never sinned. He pays the penalty for you. And by the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Christ Jesus our Savior. The only way God's mercy is expressed is one way. Jesus Christ, our Savior. There is but one way. Jesus said, I am that way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one, explicitly, no one can come to the Father except through me. And so Jesus comes. Now we think about this, and they say, well, you know, you Christians are kind of narrow-minded because really... All religions are just different paths up the same mountain that bring us to the same place. Where Jesus says, no, there's only one path that leads up the right mountain. And he says, basically, and think about this. I, I tell people this. What if, what if someone was so helpless that you invested everything you had to save them and you did that? And they said, ah, I'd rather go this way. I would rather reject your kindness and your love and do it myself. What do we have left but God to say, I provided you a way? It's like going to a starving man with, a, with plates full of his favorite food and he won't take it because he says it's too good to be true. And I'd rather go over here, you know, and play in the garbage and get my own food. And you say, okay, do it then, but you're lost. And so God judges us by our sins on the cross, and so that any other way for judgment is on your own. And so it's only through Christ Jesus our Savior, being justified by His grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We were lost. There was no hope. We sang that in the song today. There was no hope, but now we've been made heirs. We've inherited. We've been made the children of God. We have Heirs, we become heirs of eternal life. Our lives are filled with hope. Even when bad things happen to us, God is working his, his life in us, and we should have hope no matter what. Now, it's easier said than done, but that's the gospel. God takes hopeless situations, and he invades them. And I have found that God has done incredibly miraculous things as I seek him in his purposes to provide what he wants more than what I want. And I begin to understand that it's by, that it's by this uh, grace of God, the favor of God that I do not deserve this morning. I do not deserve God's kindness and his gifts flowing through me to you this morning. I do not deserve it. But it's by grace that God comes in and through us and he brings the light into the darkness and he's... He, the darkness comprehends it not. They can't put it out. This is a trustworthy statement, verse 8 says, and now we move into um, our new life. I would like to go back, actually, um, well, let's, let's read this. It is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things, I want you to uh, speak confidently so that those who have believed God may be careful to engage in good deeds. These are the things that are good and profitable for men. Now, now that we're alive in Christ and the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit makes us alive to God, now we have a new potential that God has created in us a different spirit. We're transformed. We now have an ability to do good deeds that we've never had before. It would be like me being so transformed that I would somehow bless that person that was trying to get over slowly so I couldn't get around him. How could I have blessed him? You know, how, what kind of good deed could have God brought through me that I missed uh, yesterday going to Anderson? What kind of good deeds is Christ stirring you and awakening in your heart? Because, why? The Holy Spirit's in you. He's giving you love like God has for people who are deceived, who are foolish, and now the love of Christ is not only in you, touching you, transforming you, it's flowing through you to other people. Paul says, let me suggest this. How does this good works and good deeds start? Can I give you an example here? Go to verse 1, and I'm going to get offensive 
for many of you here today. So um, I'm going to be really offensive to you. So uh, I get to do this, and you don't get your voice. <laughs> In Anderson, they had this thing the other day, and it, they talked about this after the service. They said, Why did you do that? That's stupid. You just polarize the people, let everybody say what they want. I don't do that here. You're supposed to laugh, but you didn't. Okay, look at verse 1. How do we do good deeds? Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient and be ready for every good deed. How do you feel this morning? And, and here's, where, here's where it hits the fan. How do you feel this morning about the leaders? How do you feel about your governor? How do you feel about your mayor? How do you feel about the president of the United States? Well, we're polarized here, probably 50-50. Uh, so let me go back. If, if you uh, love Barack Obama, um, let me say, how did you feel about George Bush? If you love George Bush, let me say, how do you feel about uh, Barack Obama? Um, ready for every good deed, right? It's like the person driving slow in front of you that you are not feeling kindness towards. Well, how do we start this new life? It starts with a citizenship that we have in heaven that translates into our earthly citizenship. And it says, remind them to be subject to your rulers, to authorities, to be obedient and be ready for every good deed. Now, look at the next verse. Look at your Bibles. Read the Bible. Look at what the Bible says in verse 2. To malign no one, to be uncontentious, gentle, showing every consideration for not just Democrats, but Republicans and Republicans and Democrats. Do you malign the president? Do you, um, do you talk bad about former presidents? How do you feel you're doing with uh, those in charge over you? Let, let me say, well, yeah, but you know, that guy's a jerk. And if they were God's man, then we would submit. Let me ask you this. Who is Paul? Who was, in, who was ruling the world when Paul wrote this? Nero. Nero. What did Nero do? He took Christians, soaked them in accelerants, and lit them on fire as living torches in his garden. This is the guy that took Paul's head off, if I'm not mistaken. And Paul is writing, be subject to Nero. This. Was George or was Barack worse than Nero? Yes? Oh, come on. How do, you, how do you feel about Paul writing this about Nero? I think he has one up on us, don't you think? But is there a call for you today to not malign and badmouth whoever's in charge because... They're not of the political persuasion that you are. Um, I, I get upset sometimes. There's things I don't like about both uh, our former president and our current president. And I could make funny jokes about them, and I'm kind of tempted to, but I won't. Because I really don't look for transformation to come through government. I, the church was growing exponentially under Nero, who was a real jerk a real bad person. I mean, he, he really kind of gave Adolf a run for the money. Okay? And yet, some say that when Paul went before him is when he turned and started going crazy when he rejected the gospel. Some are saying that Paul had an influence, the gospel had an influence that hardened his heart and even made him worse. And Paul's writing these words, be subject to rulers and authorities. Be obedient and ready for every good work. Now, what is our place as the church in current government? Do good things. Bless. Bake cookies for your teachers. Bless. Pray for those in leadership, whether you like them or not. If you prayed one-fourth of the amount of your complaining, you would be transformed in your attitude unto good works. And then you would be a better person. Just like me, like you think, what a jerk. 
you're, you're up here telling us how bad you are towards, on the road towards certain people. I am a jerk. I admit it. Do you, <laughs> do you want to be as bad a jerk as I am with other issues? It's obvious to me because I can put up a mirror that you can say, yeah, that's obviously your jerk. But do you see yourself that way? And can you transform your attitudes since the love of Christ has met you? Here's a quote that came out of Teaching Pool. I'm going to read it to you. It's by Josh Arthur. And this is a quote. And let me give it to you. I'm going to read it twice so that you get this down. People who engage in the political banter and become inflamed so as to lose their peace are showing that they still have an interest in the empire. People that banter so much so that they become inflamed and lose their peace are showing that their biggest citizenship, that their biggest focus is on the empire here, not there. If you lose your peace, you become inflamed. You isolate people who are idiots because they're not like you. You are showing that your citizenship and your focus is on the empire here, not there. Can I make it any plainer than that? Now, are you all offended? You can just burn right there in your anger towards me. <laughs> now, I hope I've offended all of us because I think we need that. You know, I, I, I get tired. of I, do, I bow out of political discussions because I really don't see much hope there except that Jesus will come and lead and that he will do something through us that will make a difference in smaller ways that will grow bigger. And that's what I want to focus on, the regenerating work of the Spirit. Now, verse 7, we read about being saved unto good works, chapter 2, 7, chapter 2, 14, good works, good deeds. Chapter 3, verse 1, that you're ready for every good deed. How do we react? We do positive things. We're under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, making a difference under people that we don't even agree with, but we're involving the kingdom of God to invade the darkness through our good deeds. Okay, that's verses 3.1, verse 3.8, and verse 3.14. And then we have learning behind the unprofitable uh, divisions. There are divisions that people get into. They polarize themselves. Look at what it says, verse 9, but shun foolish controversies and genealogies. There are things that you can spend, listen, spend, you can spend your life on foolish controversies and you can wrap yourself up in controversies politically and that will polarize you. You can, you can, um, you can shun these controversies and these genealogies. Like genealogies is like, well, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin and we have this, and I'm of the tribe of Levi and we one up you guys. It's like, it's not who you are in the redeeming, transforming, regenerating work of the Spirit. You are who you are in Christ apart from who you were born into and what family or what business or what political persuasion. So shun foolish controversies, genealogies, and strife and disputes about the law. Um, and I say that the law is, we're introducing new laws every day, but we're talking about a spiritual law, unprofitable and worthless, reject a factious man, people that want to shun other people because they're not the same. That guy or that woman is a jerk because they're not like me. Um, you're polarizing. It says that person is factious, and what you should do with them is you should warn them. And then after you've warned them, uh, reject a fascist man after a first and second warning. And then have nothing to do with them. You know, I, I don't want to hang out with you anymore. Your rap is just tiring me out. And it's just controversy. And it's, 
It's just wearing me down, and it's really not focusing on the renewing of what God can do through us. It's taking us off in rabbit tails, and I don't want to spend and invest my life in controversies that are going to make no difference in the world. I want to give myself to follow God unto good works and make a difference on the planet. All right? And it says, knowing that such a man is, a per is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. When I send Artemis and Trichicus to you, make every effort to come to meet me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Diligently help Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that there is nothing lacking for them. When you have people traveling through that are ministering, and in the early church, just like today, we have Caleb and Saul passing through, and we want to help them on their way, don't we? We want to see them get the pulp thing so that the people can make a living. He's got thousands of coffee plants all over the hillside now, and they're getting ready to harvest, and they need uh, pulpers, and they need hullers. And uh, we want to help him on his way. This is good deeds. How do we make a difference in the world? Well, we make a difference in Muncie, Indiana, in the Emerald Forest uh, today, by responding to the regenerating kindness of God that wants to spill over and help Caleb and Saul on their way. Isn't that great? And he says, uh, let our people also learn to engage in good deeds to meet uh, pressing needs that they may not be unfruitful. There are pressing needs that we need to meet as people, and we need to be like Christ in giving unto those needs. Now, in um, three more weeks, we're going to take an offering for world evangelism and church planting around the world apart from our own MAC movement. We're going to give to what's called, our denomination calls the Great Commission Fund. And if you're an alliance missionary, you go out and you don't have to raise money because churches like us give to the Great Commission Fund. And we haven't really been doing our part since we've been launching MAC initiatives overseas but we feel like we still need to do our part. Even though we're not making budget here, we still want to do our part. And so we're asking you to not only consider giving above what you regularly give to help um, Caleb and Saw in the coffee project, but we're also in three weeks going to come back and say, look, I know this is close, but we also need to give to the Great Commission Fund. The, the Alliance has helped us through this Great Commission Fund with grants to do what we're doing, with buildings to do what we've done. So we need to pay back, pay forward, or pay back for us since we've already got, we've been so blessed. And so we want to be engaged. We want the life of Christ coming through to do our part to touch the entire planet, whether it's here, whether it's in Champaign-Urbana or Lincoln, Nebraska, or wherever God's going to launch us for our next um, multiplication center. We want to be awakened by the Holy Spirit unto good deeds to meet the pressing needs so that they are not unfruitful. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you. There are this united community that you and I are living in. Do you feel the love that we have for Caleb and Saul when they're here and when they're showing their pictures? And did you feel it when we, got, we flashed their wedding pictures up here when they were not here? Why? Because we're united by Jesus Christ. And we're united because they were raised up for in our own midst. And we are a part of this, this unity that God is building. I believe, and I'm committed to, the local church being this expression of God's people that he stacks together and calls out to become a people, a light in our own community and beyond. So we are very committed um, to you, and you are being very committed to us. And we get to do this life together. And we get to show the love of Christ and stop being the idiots that we tend to be by the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. And we say to you, Holy Spirit, come and manifest your life in and through us this day, we pray. Amen.